two, one. Good afternoon, everybody. Some of the people on this panel are actually further afield. So good day to you wherever you are. We're going to talk about certification and the challenge of how we can make certification better. We've still got a relatively small number of businesses around the world in tourism, which are certified. One of the questions we need to address this afternoon is how we get more of them to certify. But before we go to that, I'm going to go around the panel and each, ask each person for some opening comments about how they think certification can be improved. Out of that will come a list of issues and then we'll work our way through those issues over the next hour. But Kelly, I was going to come to you first. You're an academic at the University of Utah um, in a very beautiful part of the world. You're a member of the board of GSTC, the Global Sustainable Tourism Certification, sorry, the Global Sustainable Tourism Council. Do you want to tell us something about how you see the strengths and weaknesses of the certification approach in terms of delivering more sustainable and responsible tourism? Absolutely. Good day, everyone. Um, I, I guess I have mixed emotions about certification at this juncture. We know that uh, sustainable, through research, we've We've identified sustainable tourism or responsible tourism concepts into practice, which I think has helped nudge sustainability in this very complex industry forward. Uh, I think that voluntary uh, adopted tourism businesses, some, some of those uh, practices and things and processes and procedures and services have actually facilitated sustainability progress within communities. So the copy effect has happened and we know that that's actually nudged uh, sustainability and understanding of sustainability forward. I think we're entering a phase of certification where consistency and standards is really important and having a global, global recognized criteria has been, has been beneficial in providing independence and uh, really communities, destinations, businesses, getting their heads around what it actually means to work on sustainability or responsible tourism in, in, uh, in a broader way. Um, I also think that there's been great potential and some research has documented the potential for adopting uh, businesses and external operating conditions. So facilitating certification actually helps uh, the organizational philosophy and uh, people as, at an organizational level getting their heads around sustainability. And it does reveal that research has shown that positive attitudes and interest in certification and the likelihood of, of employing certification has really attracted some visitation over non-certified product, products. However, uh, the uptake by consumers is, is low. The uptake of actual certification, as you mentioned earlier, Harold, is low. Uh, access to certification because of cost and expense and time, especially for smaller businesses, is, is low and we have to do a lot more to help bring uh, that to a more accessible level. And I think I'll stop there. I think I had a minute, so I'll, I'll stop there and look forward to hearing from others. Kelly, thanks very much indeed. Eric, you're also on the board of the Global Sustainable Tourism Council and you founded Greenview, which is a consultancy. And I think you work a lot with investors as well as with businesses. Do you want to tell us how you see the strengths and weaknesses of certification as it currently stands? Sure, happy to do so. And just to clarify the criteria, I'm actually not on the board. I'm on the technical, the standards working group of the GSTC, and we are members. Um, I mean, the, the, the strengths when a, when a certification is good in, in any context, a couple of things. First, the strength is when it's recognized. And it's something that, that, is, that is known, the label, the name, the, you know, what it stands for. That's a strength because then you stand behind that label. Um, second, is it, it provides a common framework, common language. What should we be talking about? How do we discuss it? What are the best practices? All of that. It's, it's a common language. And if its purpose is to drive consistency across a destination, a portfolio, um, or uh, a group of others, then 
then it serves that purpose when it's strong because it, it, can, it does that, right? Standardized. Um, also, it can then help people see where to get started and how and how to actually go forward. Because when you have a nebulous concept like sustainability, so what, what should I do? Having a structure helps people need structure and sustainability is by definition pretty unstructured. And so that's good when it's strong. Uh, and finally, when a certification demonstrates it makes meaningful impact on the most important issues like climate change, um, like human rights or biodiversity that are some of the most existential pieces and you know that that certification addresses it and collectively can, can improve, then it's strong. Now, when any of those are weak, that is also the double-edged sword. It's a weakness of certification because you don't necessarily have that. Um, and the other, the other issue I, I think I see is delimiting the, delimiting the boundaries of what is the role of certification versus the, what is the role of other approaches around sustainability that feed into certification and work you know, in tandem. So those are some of the things that, that we see and how we see it um, and how when we work with companies, we, we tend to work with companies that are at a company level for issues, a lot of the investor related pushes, we see interest in certification. So we see the multiple ranges and reasons why you need it. Uh, but we see the weaknesses when that becomes something you're chasing after while losing the purpose of why you should be getting it in the first place. Eric, can you just say a little more about the, the investor issue? Because you said to me on a couple of occasions in the past that there's quite a lot of interest from investors in the certification of the business that they might be investing in. Is that, am I reporting you correctly there? Definitely. I mean, investors, it's not the only criterion, but there are a myriad of things investors are looking at. Basically, are you evaluating the risks related to sustainability, the market, the physical, you know, social? Are you looking at opportunities and looking at it strategically? And then what are you doing about these issues to manage them? And of these kind of things they're looking at, certification does come up a lot. And we actually have the most widely accepted environmental certification in the world, ISO 14001, um, because it's recognized, they know it's consistent, they understand it, and any business can kind of understand that. And so we see, because it's the generic one that is applicable across all industries, that's one that they often go toward is, is your business or your facility ISO 14001 certified, um, which may not be the exact fit that we need for the conversation we're having for tourism. Yes, I'm not sure ISO 14001 works with the consumers very well, does it? It works well with the investors. Andrea, you set up Green Business a long time ago now. You are early adopters of this approach. Um, you now run a consultancy business. How do you see the strengths and weaknesses? And if I remember rightly, you're not members of GSTC, are you? Andrea, you're on mute. Uh, I'm not. Can you hear me? Not very well. Sam, can you? Sorry. If you go to the to go to your microphone, Andrea, and turn it up. I'm going to go to Leanne while you while we sort your microphone out. I'm sure we can. Leanne, you're here from South Africa. You've been involved with Fairtrade Tourism South Africa from the beginning, and recently it's run into a few problems. Do you want to just talk us through the history, maybe a little of the history, and where you're currently at? Yes. Um, hi, Harold. Thanks. Thanks very much for inviting me to be part of the process today and, and the discussion. You know. Fair trade tourism, as you mentioned, I mean, it's been around since early 2000s. In fact, around about 2000, we started with the original brainstorming of the process. Um, and certification was identified as a means of, of getting standards to the levels required around fair trade in tourism. So it's around fair trade principles in particular, which is around fair share, um, fair say, it's about respect, it's about fair purchasing, it's about equitable, equitable distribution and benefits. Um, obviously, around, it's around respect for human rights, culture, and the environment as well. So, um, so certification was a means to an end, if, that, if, you, want to, if you want to call it that, um, in trying to make tourism in South Africa, in particular, it started off in South Africa, but it extended to all the way around Africa, um, to to make tourism more sustainable and make it more focused on the fair trade principles, if you want to call it. 
Now, fair trade um, had donor funding initially and for many years had donor funding and was able to, with that donor funding, launch the certification program and launch various business development support and support programs for businesses, tourism businesses in Southern Africa and Africa, as I mentioned. What has happened? What kind of businesses oh, are you looking Sorry, now I've got Siri talking to me. <laughs> um, and, and now what has happened is in the absence of donor support, um, the, the, the entity is not sustainable and not viable without donor support. So there's been able, not, unable to get the critical mass of certified businesses in place. And the reason why is because the standards of, is very high um, to actually attain to this, to actually get the standard is very high. So not all businesses can actually um, reach a standard um, or are willing to put in the effort to go the whole hog because it's, it's very, it's all encompassing. So I might be as a business, I might be very good at say for example, in on the respect field or side or the environmental side but the fair trade standard is pretty complex um, and it requires adherence to all components of it. So, um, it, which is, it makes it very difficult for business, business to actually reach that level. And one of the biggest weaknesses for certification in, as a whole is the fact that it's, it is elitist um, and, it, and it will, and it will uh, uh, prevent, because, of the stand, because the standards are, at, are where they are, it's preventing your grassroots entities from actually forming part of the program and, and becoming a reaching the standard that, that is actually required. And really, I mean, grassroots businesses are often where a, lot of the, where a lot of the transformation efforts can actually start to happen. So, um, so but I mean, but from the, from the positive perspective, there's a lot of brand and goodwill around the fair trade brand, the fair trade tourism brand, which obviously gives a lot of consumer confidence um, that they know that they that they that they are buying what 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 they think they're buying in terms of sustainability and around the fair trade principles, which is which is great. The other huge advantage is the learnings um, and the experience that certified businesses go through to become certified. So the standards are raised quite significantly through that process. They learn from each other. They learn from from the assessors or the auditors, and they also learn from the advisors that help them to, to improve their standards. Um, and they're continually striving to improve that and to become better at what they're trying to achieve, which is a huge positive from, from, from the, that, that the that this certification is actually bringing into tourism in the country. Um, but yeah, so the challenge around the, the challenge now is around the sustainability of the business model, getting enough uh, critical mass to actually drive the business forward. Um, the members of the certified businesses love the brand um, and they, they love being part of the network. They love being sharing from each other, learning from each other. That's, that's, that goes without say. Um, the, other, the other challenge is seeing direct bums and beds as a result of being certified. So are they actually getting increased bookings because they're certified? The majority of them are saying yes, but it's difficult to measure that there's a direct relationship to be certified as fair trade and bums and beds. So these are some of the challenges we have to work through. There's a lot more. There's a lot more positives, a lot more negatives, but I'll leave it up to everybody else to talk as well. Thanks, Leanne. And Jaya, I think your microphone's been fixed. Can you hear me now? Yes, absolutely. Fantastic. Good. So don't have to shout. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Harold, and, and thanks, everybody. Um, yes, yeah, so we started uh, Green Tourism 23 years ago. Um, when things were in this world were completely different um, and didn't, people didn't know what sustainability was. And we attracted an awful lot of um, very green businesses that are already doing a lot. Um, I think one of the biggest strengths of certification is around the fact it is a business development tool. It's very much, as other people have said, a framework, an opportunity for staff and, and um, um, businesses to actually pull together and work through a process so they know where to start, they know where to aim for, and through the certification process, if the certification label offers it, they can get advice and support on how to move um, through the, 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 the measures, uh, identify savings, identify improvements. I think the, um, one of the big strengths of, of our certification and others that have it is, is a tiered approach, so that there's actually an opportunity for people to 
continue to improve and have the opportunity to come into an entry level. And it's not just for the better businesses that are doing lots. It, it encourages other businesses to come in and, and get involved. Um, it's something that businesses and hotels can benchmark against themselves, especially within a group. So we have a lot of hotel groups that work together to actually look at within their, their standard, within their group, how they're achieving things. And I think it also provides um, the ability for uh, businesses to tell their green story. It gives them um, the uh, uh, um, uh, it gives them the uh, opportunity and confidence to tell people they're doing something because they have been certified by a third party, uh, by an independent person. And also, we see a lot of businesses in the UK are are, ex are, are increasing their income significantly by having the certification, by having green tourism, because it is becoming was in the past and more increasingly now a requirement of especially public sectors and large companies for people to have some kind of certification and green tourism is recognized in the UK as, as that certification um, that people need. Um, in terms of weaknesses I think there's um, uh, as, as been mentioned before that actually it, some certification or certification can be just to reward those are the better businesses anyway and it doesn't actually encourage other businesses to come on board so we want to make sure that certification is accessible to everybody. It's it's got a tiered approach and it's it's affordable for everybody. So they can they can come on board and do the small bits and build up, save some money, and then move on to the higher levels. I think a big uh, weakness of a lot of the certification programs is that there's a one-off inspection every two or three years, which means it's a very small snapshot of a business's um, uh, performance. And I think that's why we've changed to having a continual online interactive assessment process because businesses don't want to uh, have an inspection, get their report and then sit there and go, oh, what am I going to do for the next two years? They actually want to say, well, actually, I've got my action plan. I want to go away and do something, come back and find out if, I, if my score's improved or if I've got a higher level or if I've, um, you know, if I've saved more money. So I think the, the ability to have an interactive, continuous improvement is something that's a weakness in a lot of certification. And I think it's something that we need to build into that going forward. And I think also, um, as Eric said, it, it's not, ident not um, um, necessarily understood or identified by customers. There needs to be better information from the labels themselves as to what they're doing, um, what, why the, the hotels or the, or the uh, uh, accommodation has been accredited, but also that the hotels themselves should be confident in telling their story and telling their customers why they're green and what they've been given credit for. And that's why we've developed a series of development, sustainable development goals, um, which are actually based around our pillars of people, places and planet. And those uh, are uh, 15 different areas where there's percentage scores attributed to each of them, depending on what they're achieving within each of those goals, which they can then use in their reports, in their corporate plans, in, in nice uh, literature for their guests in their bedrooms to say, this is why we're green. We've achieved so much in biodiversity. We've achieved so much in equality. We've done so much in carbon reduction. And if you want to respond to that, please do so. Um, we're on a journey where we're, we're not uh, as green as we could be. And that gives the opportunity for the guests to come back and say, well, you said you were green, but actually I've seen X, Y, and Z in my room, which isn't really what I expected, but it starts the dialogue. It gives the opportunity for the hotel to respond to it and say, well, we've, we've got our framework. We've got our green label. Uh, we're working towards that. And it's great that you've engaged with it. And, and how can we uh, help improve for the next time you come visitors. Thanks Andrea. And one of the things that is clear I think is that the only people who are there all the time are the guests. Doesn't matter what inspection system you use, the only people who are going to be there multiple times in any one period will be the guests. And I guess that with an increasingly well-educated uh, group of visitors because of what's happening in schools for example, we're going to, businesses will face more and more knowledgeable clients coming through the front door now have seen good practices in other places and therefore perhaps feel better equipped to to criticize when they see things which they think are wrong but Eric can I come back to one of the things I think you said if my notes are right which is that one of the problems is knowing what the label actually stands for because the, there are multiple criteria aren't there? there are multiple categories of things and that's a big difference with South African and Whalian because they're the emphasis was on this notion of fair trade, given inequality 
um, in international trade around tourism. There's a real sense mm -hmm. of the socioeconomic being more important. Mm -hmm. But many of the green labels came from an environmental perspective. So just even matching those two things together has its own intrinsic problems. I guess yeah. where it becomes very sharp is the how does the tourist, how does the guest know where, what the performance of the hotel is on the things that matter to them, whether it's water or carbon or um, employment practices? How can the guest know what the certification means in those terms? I think, I think the guest to know they'll have to be it'll have to be communicated to them, which it would be at some level when they're looking to book, choosing in the booking channel at the hotel. Um, or other, but I think the, the the juxtaposition there is, as I said before, certification helps you know set a framework and segment out the various multitude of topics and actions around sustainability. But then when it comes to the guests, they need something tangible, and they and a lot of times it's part of the experience. And so to have the green stamp, to then explain that stamp to them, a, a good certification in in this realm will have a lot of complexity to it. Um, and so the solution, which I'm seeing the distribution side going is to start with the tangible saying, you know, here are the things this hotel, this hotel is single use plastic free. This hotel has vegetarian vegan menus. This hotel has a community donation project. And you have those, those attributes, that tangibility to it that the guests can see when they're making their decisions and then it's communicated to them. And then some guests will care more, some, you know, some care about their health, most, most do. Some will care about the farm. Some say, I want to only stay in a place that's climbing, it's carbon neutral, because obviously in my view, it's tough to have a certification and not really address carbon uh, if we're going to make real difference. And so the issue there is, okay, I see the practices. Some are interested in, you know, more than others, but like in the same way you, you choose a hotel. Okay. I care about the fitness center. I care about the breakfast. I care about the proximity. I care about the rate. Things will be different, but then there's that, that like three, four star that has the all encompassing. So then you see this, the label and that label then gives that assurance that, okay, yes, they're doing the things that I understand and I'm interested in, and it has that label of guarantee that yes, they're, you know, they're legit. That's that's where I think it is going to go, uh, based on the, the distribution side getting into the game now. I'm sure somebody's going to correct me, but let me take the gamble on saying the way I think it's it has evolved, and maybe the way it will evolve. I mean, it, it seems to me that most of the labels are still really focused on on the process questions, aren't they? I mean, the inspections that go on, you look through the GSTC criteria, a lot of it is about the process that has been applied to the management of the place. And that's where the overlap is with the ISO 14001, I think, Eric. There's a clear set of relationships there. It's about that. So if I think back to when I was at school, you know, I always used to get marks for effort and marks for attainment. And it does seem to me that at the moment, the, the emphasis is rather more on the effort and the consumer, even if there is a mark for attainment, we don't see it as consumers of those businesses. A few corporate clients do now because they insist on seeing what the carbon per guest night is or whatever. But as an individual consumer, I don't see that and I can't see it. I can only know that somebody's given a, a two, three or four stars for, for effort but I don't see what the attainment is. Is there any way we could make progress on that, do you think? Anybody who wants to come back at me? Kelly, what do you think? Yeah, I, I do believe we need to make progress on that level. And, and I think some of it starts with hotels and entities that are adopting sustainability practices to, to put their journey out there a lot more. Um, I think it's hard Sometimes some sites are awesome at it. Others you have to really dig to understand. And, and I think the reason for that, at least what I've heard in the United States um, from the 25 plus certification statewide programs that we have is people are afraid that they're not quite there yet. And we don't know what quite there means. So they're afraid to put their journey out there without being completely um, to, to some level that they expect of themselves. But I think we have to educate consumers, right? That this is a journey. And, and I love to hear that word being used by others on this panel because technology changes, uh, circumstances changes, uh, support in, in states and countries changes, incentive programs change. So I think we have to be more vocal about this is a journey and, and because of that, 
give people credit for their journey and what they're trying to achieve and um, be more transparent about that journey. Can I just come in? I also think that, um, Harold, you're probably not the most um, uh, mainstream traveler uh, out there um, because I don't think from the research that we've done that actually many consumers are that interested in how many litres of water their shower is. What they want to do is make sure that it's a good quality shower, that it's heated to the right temperature. They're not that concerned about um, uh, the energy side of it, as long as it's comfortable and they can turn it up and down. I think what's important for certification is it's educating the, the businesses to internally manage their, their, their carbon and their water and, and, and waste management sides properly, and that they can use metrics internally to make sure that they're reducing their, their running costs and saving the planet. From the consumer's point of view, they want to know that they are doing something to save the planet, but they're also as interested in where the local food is, where they can go walking and cycling, that they're donating to a local charity, that they're sponsoring a bear at the local zoo, whatever. It's very much a, a, a feel-good factor that consumers are looking for. And I, I, that's not to say that I think that certification should be used as a greenwash situation, absolutely not, which is why the certification labels are there to do the inspections to make sure the figures are coming out. But I'm not convinced that consumers are going to choose a hotel based on how much water is coming out of a shower. You might do, but I, I don't think mainstream people will. And Joe, in my defence, I think that's the nicest thing that's been said to me over the last couple of days. What, um, what, what worries me, though, is if that is the case, then why bother with certification? Because it's very easy for the consumer themselves to check whether the hotel is telling them where they can go and cycle. It's easy, to, much easier to check on the food. The things which are not so clear are things like the employment standards and the consumption of carbon and water. Eric, you want to have a go, come on. Just on that point, um, I'd love to get back into the process versus outcomes and standards. That, 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 that's the heart of this whole conversation for me. But um, we, we, when we get into this discussion, we tend to assume that the guest is the customer. And in a lot of hotels, that's not the case where they have a large group and business demand. And it is definitely happening right now that corporate customers are making requests to see carbon water metrics and, and indicating they're making decisions based on that. Um, we're getting so much, you know, in, in interest in our, our benchmarking, our online tools to get the, the range of performance so that they can then make, make choices about it. And, and they come to us saying, you know, this is what we're doing. And then the hotel companies, have, they're all telling us this. And so the guest, the transient leisure guest may not have the, the you know, capacity to look at that and compare when they're making the decision. But at a corporate level, it's definitely happening. And it is very specific. And actually... Yeah point of having the certification, sorry how to interrupt, but the certification is that you get them on the, the, the consumer facing, you want a local food, the, 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 like, the, the local history, the culture, whatever, but the certification label can then uh, impose the, uh, the, the, uh, the metrics in terms of we want you to reduce your water by so much, we want to reduce your carbon by so much, or actually you're, you're, you're not going to achieve the highest level because you haven't done anything on carbon, water and waste. So it allows them to have the, the, the control over that side of things. Yeah, and can we come back to you? Because in, in some ways, what, what Fairtrade Tourism South Africa was, is doing still is really the hardest part of this, isn't it? Because you were focused very much, you did the other things as well, but the main focus was on some kind of fair treatment of the, of the staff, really. I mean, uh -huh. that's at the heart of it. And that's yeah. extraordinarily difficult for a consumer, however knowledgeable they are about the environment or whatever, it's the hardest thing for the consumer to access. Do you have any optimism, Leanne, that we will get to a system where we can actually tell that we're going to stay in a hotel or a guest house or a, 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 a backpacker's place where the staff are treated well and treated reasonably, uh, given the, the background of the country that they're in? So... Harold, I actually disagree with you from that, that it's the hardest bit for a, for a consumer to actually test because the consumer is, um, or your client, is face-to-face -face with, with your staff all the time. Um, and you can tell, people can tell immediately, you can walk into an establishment, you can feel the vibe, you can feel how people have been treated and the, and the, and the way they are they're acting um, in terms of the, the culture of, of the entity. And the, and the culture is driven a lot by respect. It's, it's driven by fairness um, and how people believe that they have been treated and how they've been respected in the environment. So 
yes, it is dif it's difficult to assess. It is difficult and, and obviously moods come into play and all sorts of things come into play. There's all sorts of variables, but it's actually from a fair trade perspective, um, that is why we've got to be very stringent in terms of how we actually go out and, and, and do and assess what we assess because it is easy for the consumer to, to pick up. It's not so easy for them to measure uh, how much water they're using or what their electricity consumption is, but it's easy to pick up how people are treated in an organization. Um, and and it's, easy, it's easy to speak to people as well. Um, and, you know, I mean, I really do believe that I mean, which we, uh, Kelly spoke about the journey. The journey is very important. The, um, and the, the, the journey towards fair trade, towards sustainability, um, and go walking that journey with, with your clients is very important. Um, so that because there's always room for improvement. So although, um, al al although we're talking about possibly putting some sort of metrics out there, um, it's, it, it's important that we don't scare clients away, potential clients away or customers away, those who are going along that journey um, and recognizing that, 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 it, that, that there is a process to be involved, that is involved. And um, just going back to some of the previous, the earlier conversations, it's around communication. I don't know how often people arrive at an establishment and as they arrive at the establishments, they find out that this particular establishment is, has got strong sustain sustainability practices. Um, so it's often a well-kept secret and the communication needs to be strengthened and it is does come down it comes down to this to this um to the certification label but it also comes down to the 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 um the, the property itself the, the provide itself they need to tell their journey more and certification does give them confidence to tell that to tell their story um so which which is important I agree. There is clearly there's a lot of tall poppy syndrome, the fear that if you put your head above the parapet and claim to be doing something, uh, you'll be shot down for it. Although it doesn't stop people applying for the Responsible Tourism Awards, which is interesting in its own way. <laughs> We've had a question from, from our audience saying, um, <laughs> this is, this is or, I can't imagine this ever happening, but the question is, they're saying now is the time for an international certificate that is globally recognised. How can we work together to make this happen now? And in a way, Kelly, that's what GSTC has been about for quite a long period of time now. Yeah. Um, we've had another question, which is even more brutal in a way, which is how many of the people who apply for a certificate don't get one? Um, I don't know if you are able or willing to answer either, either of those questions, but definitely we've got people in the audience who would like to know. <coughs> Well, I can answer the question about how many people apply and don't get one. Go on. Um, um, so we this have, is for green tourism. It's not for not uh, in general. No, no, this is green for green tourism. So we have a lot of people engage with us at very early levels and wanting to get started, and we work with them. We have an online quiz they can do to try it out. So actually, we have very few people who don't actually achieve a certification in the end, but when they start out, they may be definitely below bronze. So probably around about. 15, 20% of the people who contact us aren't ready at bronze level yet, but they want to get there and they want to achieve it. So we help and work with them to make sure they do achieve it. And how many drop out without making the effort, Andrea? Um, we, have a, we have something like um, 70 inquiries a month. And of those, probably 50% go forwards to, to the next stage. And we probably have about 35% actually join. I just <laughs> tell you that you can't answer the first part of that question because you, you, you're not that yeah, kind of organisation. Well, I mean, the aspiration for a global label, I think you could perhaps say something about that. Yeah, I, I guess I would start back in 2000 when we had the Mohunk meeting in New York, upstate New York, and people were concerned at that juncture. I think at that time there were 300 plus labels uh, specifically for tourism. And there was a lot of greenwashing going on. So I think out of those discussions with many certification bodies around the globe, there was an interest in creating an accreditation body uh, for sustainable tourism labels. And that's really the goal of the GSTC. One of the goals of the GSTC is to help bring at least a minimum criteria together in defining sustainability for tourism and co-label 
with certification bodies that are recognized and accredited over time. And, and we're starting to see more uptake, like people are using the GSTC as a starting place, right? It's not a certification. It is a global recognized set of minimum criteria that addressed all aspects of sustainability to try and bring the world together around a minimum level of acknowledgement. And, and I think that's really important because they're, people are using them in exploring their journey, right? They're, they're using them at destination levels. I got a call from Moab the other day that's interested in how they can be more sustainable as a, as a city adjacent to a national park. So they are using the criteria on a global basis to understand, okay, at minimum, what should we be striving towards? And certainly a lot of the certification bodies, the well-known ones, the ones that have hung in there through time have, are even maybe beyond what the GSTC established, but we know that those are critical elements in the sustainability uh, of tourism globally. I don't think because of the, the context and individual context of various destinations around the world, that if you look at the G GSTC criteria, these can be applied in any context from small business to large business, from rainforest to West Desert here in Utah. Uh, but, but the context and the indicators then that are applied at certification level are really where the rubber meets the road and, and helps people identify the specific needs of those various communities. And, and I think that's, that's really important to understand context. Thanks, Kelly. Eric, can we come back to, the, to, to your request really that we talk a bit more about the, the challenge of the difference between the process and the attainment? Because it does seem to me, I think you and I agree about that, it's at the heart, in a way, of the problem. But to give that question a bit more of an edge, what, one of the things that worries me about the, the GSTC list is there's an awful lot of potential things which you might choose to do. And the example I always give, I live in England about 400 miles from where my sister lives. She's in an area of water stress because they've got too much. She has a flooding problem. I'm in an area with the same water, the same rainfall as Israel. We have a massive problem. Now, I wouldn't want a hotel in North Wales to place the same priority on, on managing its water supply as I would a hotel adjacent to me in Kent. And it seems to me there is a problem in that sense. The issues, there are issues which are common across the world, but their importance varies from place to place. It's really probably only plastic and carbon, which are genuinely global issues in that sense, in the sense that they are an issue everywhere. Um, there are many issues which arise in all parts of the world, but do you see, how do you see a, a way through this as, as we move forward to hopefully a better form of certification? Who I should be setting what the local priorities are, for example? I mean, set, setting local priorities, that's, that should be the local community, right? And local stakeholders. But I think the, the, the going back to it um, on process, so first, uh, if you look at, at, at certification, if we go back and say, okay, what are the, the things you should have? You should have these 20, these 30 things to make your hotel efficient, to make sure it's doing the right things. The next question the hotel would ask is, well, how do I do this? And so that's where, you know, like schemes like, you know, Andreas, the green tourism, you, you tell them and you show them the way, here's how you execute at the property. And that's so important because that, that sort of goes by the wayside when we start looking at the criteria. And so process, we hammer this over and over again at the company level saying, you need to look at process to start at, at a base. And then, so that's why process comes into play no matter what in sustainability, because it is a lot of changing the way you do things. Now on GSTC, um, as Kelly mentioned, I mean, it, it, is, it is a framework and it started as a, a, a set of criteria. And so it lays the landscape for the, the things you should talk about. And through the strength I talked about, I said, here, you wanna talk about all the things you should be doing and the areas you should be addressing. And GSTC sort of covers that. And it does act as, and it is the de facto, uh, we'll call it a standard, call it a framework, call it whatever. Um, it is the one that everyone is turning to and continue to turn to for how do you address sustainability in a hotel? Um, now, 
how do you do it really well is the next phase. And, but, but in order to do that, first you have to get everybody on the same page to say, what should we be doing and what do we address? Now in our, our business, we don't certify. I spend a lot of time explaining to people that we do not certify, that we want to be known as independents and we help with process, we help back of house, we help with benchmarking. Um, and we actually aligned our software that we have for, co for corporate and for individual properties to the GSTC because we realized that one, that's the framework. And then two, we help them interpret what are the practices you should be doing and how do those fit and help them then work toward it. If companies at a company level say for my portfolio, I want to get it GSTC aligned. And then if they say, I want to go a certification route, you've got everything there. And depending on whatever direction you go, you have your documentation, you have your ongoing management, you have your tool and you sort of go there. Now that's where it comes to the local context then if the criteria specifically embed local context in them, which GSCC does a fairly good job of doing, then it's good. What, I mean, there could be a little bit more on water, water scarcity, for example, water stress, and there needs to be definite attention paid. If a certifier wants to certify, you need to, like in, in Cape Town, in you know, Australia, in some other places, California, it, you need a green certification that has real, real teeth on the water side because it's important. So that next piece, but that hopefully is the next step now that we've got this common criteria where it seems like the industry and its players are going. But Eric, if we are going to go to that next step, what is the chance, do you think, of going to something which, let's call it certification plus. So it's the certification schemes as we have it with the GSTC listed criteria as we have it. But with the certifier actually also checking that the claims, the specific claims that we encourage the hotel or tour operator to make, actually stands behind those as well. So it seems to me, Andre, we'll come to you in a second, the scheme you set up with, with checking people's uh, water bills, the electricity bills remotely enables you to do that. But I wonder whether we can get to something, Eric, where there's a kind of mark for, for the effort, if you like, the process. But there's also a, a, an opportunity to encourage people to take the risk of actually saying what they've achieved and overcoming this sort of tall poppy syndrome, the fear people have of standing out and saying what they've achieved. Well, just, just one comment there, because I know Andrew can answer this better. But for me, once, once everybody can claim that they're certified, therein lies the competitiveness of it, right? Once certification is table stakes or at least getting a minimum level of something that's process based, then you step up your game. And that's in the corporate world, that's, that's the way that it works. It's, it's a matter of, okay, everybody needs to do this. Everybody needs a policy of human rights. Okay, great. Everybody's got that. Now, what's the next best thing? We want to be a leader. What's the next thing? Okay, you have to do a supplier assessment on human rights. You have to you know, do human rights assessment throughout your supply chain. It, you know, it, it moves, and that's what moves the industry up and forward. So I, I would go that route for how you get to that plus. Um, and then what that entails is a broadening and diversification of the services and opportunities that arise out of it. And Joy, do you want to come back on this as well? Yeah, I think um, th there's two things here. I mean, there's, there's, there's setting standards or, or levels for achieving water conservation or, or energy efficiency. Um, but the danger with that is that all of the businesses we're talking about are so very, 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 very different. It's so many different, different locations with different building fabrics, different uh, levels of, of quality. It becomes a very complex matrix that you'd have to achieve. So we try and concentrate on actually trying to get the businesses themselves to understand what their current level of, of, of energy efficiency is or energy costs are, and then look at reducing it so much percentage year on year. So they're benchmarking against themselves, not necessarily benchmarking against the standard, which likelihood is gonna to have to be so, the wide range so wide and encompass everybody is actually not gonna be meaningful. Um, so I think that um, the ability to get businesses to give you information about the metrics that they've got and then set targets for them individually or within a group if they're part of a hotel group um, I think that's the best way to go forward. But from what you're saying Andrea it sounds as though people could now be reporting how much they've improved their water efficiency year on year. Nothing oh, stop them doing that. No, no, absolutely. And, and that's that's exactly what we do with it within our, with our, our calculator side of things is that we encourage them to say we've reduced our water by so much percent. We've and, 
so much less going to zero waste going to, to, to landfill or reduction of our carbon so much this year. And, and it's actually part of our, our standard that, that we're requiring them to actually not only uh, uh, do that and in, in do the measuring, but actually sharing it and reporting it and sharing it on publicly with their guests through a, a, a public report or, or on their website. And what proportion of your people are doing that? <laughs> right. Um, probably, uh, probably about 40 to 50 percent. Um, and I would say that's because, I mean, we, we cover two and a half thousand businesses across the UK, of which something like 1500 accommodation providers and about 900 of them are hotels. And it's probably the hotels that are more likely to be doing that. Leanne, can I come back to you? Because I'm, I've been thinking about what you said about whether people can work out the the labour conditions from their interaction. I wonder whether you can do that in South Africa because you are South African. I'm not so sure that when I visit, I have that awareness. I wonder how possible it is to do it in someone else's culture, in someone else's place. I'm not sure that that I'm able to do it, for example. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, it's it's possible that what, what you're saying, but I, it's but there's no reason why you or anybody else can't ask the basic questions um, to, to your housekeeper, to, to the waiter, who, who, whoever you're interacting with, to the guide. You, can, you know, how do you enjoy working here? Um, how are your wages? Uh, you know, that sort of, that, that type of, um, and, 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 that, and get them to talk about how are the local communities benefiting from this particular lodge or hotel or, what, what, whatever it is, the experience that, that, you, that you're participating in. So I, I think, it, I really do believe it's quite difficult to hide um, if, if I am not complying to the standards. I think it's quite difficult to hide um, and, and, and not, not be caught out. Um, to be honest, Andrea, uh, Leanne, you, 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 you've reminded me that I have actually seen that happen on cruise lines. So clearly it is possible. It's just a matter of the consumers being more um more more well i guess thinking about it and asking the questions we've had yeah. a whole host of questions coming in and we're in the last 15 minutes i kind of feel obliged to to look for answers to some of these um one which i i have to say i have some sympathy with um the global south is most impacted by covid with local enterprises on their knees how can you persuade them to worry about certification, which is a Western indulgence. Can I, can, I, can, I, can I come in here, Harold? Please do. Okay, so I mean, this is obviously um, one of the biggest challenges that obviously that, that fair trade tourism is facing at this particular moment in time, because the businesses themselves are on their knees, as, as they're saying. They've got no money, they cannot pay for that certification. Um, but there are those businesses, I mean, in reality, we are going to lose clients because those businesses are not going to reopen. Um, but there are those businesses that are actually recognizing that sustainability has been heightened during this time of COVID and the need for sustainability, recognizing that consumers themselves and potential travelers um, are thinking more about the impact of what they are doing on livelihoods and on the environment. Um, and so the importance of proving um, or approving your sustainability and your commitment and your commitment to people during this time and the environment as a business becomes even more important. Um, and it's, this, is, this is actually um, where there's the benefits of actually putting your head, head up and actually showing and saying this is, this is the principles that we adhere to and this is what we've been doing and this is how we've been sticking to it to the best we can during the lockdown while we've had no guests, while we've had no revenue. And those businesses will actually um, benefit more from that certification in the long run. So they are wanting to stick around and make, make sure that this actually, that, that, that they can prove, prove this. So it's becoming more and more relevant to them. Okay. I, I would also like to add, I, I am a volunteer with the Tourism and Protected Areas Specialist Group and we have a paper coming out just looking at park tourism specifically, but what we, what we realize through this is the incredible dependency on tourism 
uh, especially for communities, gateway communities or communities that benefit from uh, natural resource tourism. And natural resource tourism, I can say in Utah has just skyrocketed uh, because of the benefits of being outdoors. So in, in all of that, we have to continually look at ways to be more resilient and, and even looking at um, financial ways to, to help communities recover and cover things like pandemics, but it's also pointed very starkly to maintaining a healthy ecosystem. So we're seeing a lot, an uptake on courses uh, at the GSTC. A lot of people are taking courses to learn more about this. And I think there's an incredible awareness as Leanne has, has mentioned. So I, I totally support those comments. Eric, you're trying to come in. Yeah, quickly. I mean, I totally agree and echo that. I think one, the issues and the challenges of sustainability are not going away. They're going to get worse uh, on all levels. That's not going away. People know that. Um, one, yeah, biz, everybody's hurting right now. Right? Businesses are hurting. Um, but there is the green recovery aspect is real. The green finance is real. We, we're doing a project helping the IFC right now that's looking to help uh, banks in seven countries restructure loans to hotels to obtain more credit or refinance their terms in exchange for efficiency projects in energy and water that they're tied to the loan. I mean, there's, that, there's this kind of stuff going on all over the place. There's more money out. So I think um, th that aspect is there. Second, hotels, yeah, obviously no one wants to spend any more money than they have to. But if customers start requiring it, governments start looking into it, investors start looking into it, partners, then they're going to have to go after it because it's going to become the cost of doing business. And then finally, I would disagree that it's a Western indulgence. I mean, I'm here in Singapore. Certification and standards are legit. I mean, they're serious uh, here. And not even Singapore, Thailand. Look at the standards and certification things going on in Thailand. I mean, the ASEAN nations in their tourism working group, Southeast Asia, they've got standards for a toilet. There's an ASEAN toilet standard to have consistency and quality in the toilets for tourism operations. I mean, I, I think they understand the value and importance of this, and I disagree it's a Western indulgence in any way. I can also understand, though, how with the extremists that many businesses are in at the moment, particularly the, the smaller businesses of the sort that uh, Leanne was talking about, for them it is really difficult now, I think, to, to engage on the on the certification journey. We have to hope that they bounce back as businesses. I have to say I have sympathy with this. I'm going to re read the question in full, so as you know, it's not from me. Um, but it's this, if it's difficult for industry professionals to understand certification, how can we expect consumers to? We need a global scheme. And in a way, I think that sums up the problem. It is an incredibly complex issue, isn't it? It certainly is, Harold, and I think um, it, 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 it's actually very difficult to explain certification um, to anybody uh, because it's very specific to actually each individual business because they address it in a different way because they've all got different issues, whether it's to do with energy, water or, or staff or, or, or the local community. Um, so I think from our point of view, the way we've got our solution around here is, is getting the businesses to talk about what they're doing. Telling their green story is the most important thing. And it, it can include this, the metrics, it can include what they're doing with their staff, they can include what they're doing with the local community. And that's the most important thing. And that's the only way that customers are going to really, really understand it. I think one of the things that's coming out through the, the, the panels we've had this year at WTM is that the storytelling around this, credible stories, backed up with evidence are really important to making the case. Uh, we're, we're running up against the end of, of this session. Let's try to end on an optimistic note. Um, what I'd like to do is go around each of you and ask you to come up with your recommendations for how we gather more momentum behind it. I've been massively disappointed by how slowly certification has been taken up. And we can probably debate why for another couple of hours. But let's just take it as understood that we've still got a problem about spreading certification and maybe just go around the panel and hear your ideas about how we might reinvigorate the, the momentum behind it. Kelly, do you want to, to start with that? Sure. I, I mean, as an educator, I think it's in my DNA to say that 
education is key here. And it's not just uh, educating businesses and people involved in the tourism sector. It's really a global education that needs to occur for all, all of us, right? We have to learn about sustainability and what's impacting our lives. And I think pandemics and, and other global crises bring that to our attention. And in one way, we're thinking about it uh, with some colleagues, and we hope to get a paper out about this, is looking at engaging uh, more of society in evaluating as they travel. And one of, the, one of the things that we've been thinking about a lot is citizen science uh, platforms that, that help bring uh, the non-scientist or the the casual bird observer into a world uh, and being part of that world. And I think we have to ensure that society is more a part of this sustainability journey as a whole. Uh, tourism obviously touches so many lives in so many ways. And it's one of those good examples of why sustainability is so important um, because of the, the reach and the complexities associated with the sector itself. But I do think education in society to help engage people, all people, in, in their view of what's going on in the world around them. So we're looking at this idea of citizen science and in engaging society at a broader level. And I'm hopeful that that continuing, it feels like there's momentum behind education globally now. Um, and I'm hoping that that moves us forward. Thanks for that, Kelly. Eric, what, what's your thinking about how to move this agenda on? Well, I think unfortunately there's a lot of people thinking about moving the agenda and forward and, and that we're seeing so many new initiatives and things coming out. Why don't we start something? We need to do something. We need solutions right now, not initiatives. We don't need a, two, three dozen other things starting up and trying to gain attention And because I, I think this is important, so I'm going to do something. We need to coalesce around this. We have you know, a handful of years to really get this right. We need to coalesce around the solutions that are there. The programs that are working, those who are proven, and those that are there. That's I think that's what we need to do is recognize that. Let's let's just go with what we've got, and and work with it. Um, and then back to the earlier question: of How do you, if if it's tough for a professional, how do you engage the consumer? Got to be honest. The GSTC has a pretty logo. That 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 footprint. That you know the the you know that. The, use use a logo. Looks good. Put it on you know put it on a hat get more, more understanding of the, of the concept behind a good logo. One of the, uh, I wasn't in, I don't think the, behind my question was not any idea that we might want to find something new. It's much more how we might reinvigorate what we've got really and get more people to start yeah. using it. Sorry, not that, not that you suggested that, but that's what I'm seeing. We're seeing so many new initiatives oh, really? coming out. Oh, so many new initiatives coming out. And that's- no, I that's, agree, that would be, that's why I talk about certification plus because it seems to me we need to keep building on what we've got, not starting something. Andrea, your thoughts? We are really beginning to be up against the clock. Yeah, so, um, um, I think absolutely certification has been done the same way for many years. And I think time now to completely reinvent the way certification is done. We need to engage much better with um, consumers. We need to engage much better with the, with the businesses. We need to have the ability to interact with them on a continuous basis. And we should be engaging and embracing technology to do that. And also engage with the young people who are gonna be the people who are gonna be the future to get them involved with it. And I think that is the way that we will get uh, more engagement, um, getting the businesses to understand that they can get involved and it is a benefit for them to be involved, but also getting the consumers involved in terms of understanding that by choosing a, a hotel with a certification that they're doing something good for the planet, which is actually what businesses people are actually more interested in now. Leanne, your thoughts. Okay, so I see a responsible tourism and su sustainability needs to become a, a hygiene factor um, in our tourism sector. And we need to start moving quite fast in that direction. Otherwise, I think we could, we're going to be seriously left behind. One thing that I think we need to really play on and work with is the huge learning that businesses go through through the certification process. And it's learning from experts. It's learning from peers. Um, it's learning from assessors and the, and the huge journey and the evolution that they go through and what a difference it can make in the lives of people and of businesses by going through that process. Um, and then 
everybody's spoken about it. It's about communication. We've got to communicate more. And it's, a, it's about everybody needs to communicate more. We need to tell more stories. We're not telling the stories loud enough and we're not telling them often enough and we're not being clear enough. And we've got to be open. We've got to be transparent about what we're achieving and, 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 and where we want to go to as well. Set our targets and head for there. Be transparent, be open. I love the I love the idea of the citizen science, and I do believe we need to go there too. That's but that's a great idea, Kelly. Thanks, Thanks very much, Leanne. I think absolutely this business of getting people to talk more about it and to be more transparent is really important going forward. Can I thank you all for your contributions this afternoon? It's been a very lively panel, and I'm sure we're going to return to this, Kelly, if um, if you're willing to engage in your Eric too. We need to get this story out there and we need to be talking about it a lot more than we have. Thank you very much indeed this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thank really nice to meet you. Take care. Bye, everybody. <laughs>